Hello and welcome to Street Check, the weekly podcast from Kevin Wealth Network, which has been publishing investing research insights and recommendations since 1970. I'm Chris Preston, uh, Cabot's Vice President of Content and Chief Analyst of Cabot's Talk of the Week. I'm Brad Simmerman. I'm the Managing Editor of the Cabot Wealth Daily Newsletter and uh, Web Editor here. And today we will be bringing on Tom Hutchinson, Chief Analyst of Cabot Dividend Investor, Income Advisor, and the uh, Cabot Retirement Club. But before we get to him, we are going to cover our big three, three pressing news items that demand coverage. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about the new bull market, the crypto crackdown, and we'll be talking about the death of the meme stocks, the final nail in the coffin. But before we get there, Chris, I got to ask you, are you getting that smoke? Are you you catching that smoke? Uh, this, this is a pickup basketball reference. No, um, <laughs> no, uh, it's funny. So I live in Vermont uh, for those who don't know. I think we mentioned in past podcast but we're not going to hold people to that um so you'd think i'm right in the line of fire of these canadian wildfires we've seen you've probably seen some of the images in new york city uh boston you know toronto any anywhere in the northeast um it's looked like an end of day scenario of the red skies and you know just horrible looking uh scene uh vermont has not gotten that we did have a warning the other day that the air wasn't great, but it, it didn't look obviously horrible. Um, it looks like it sort of went around us. So I think, you know, I think it was afraid of Vermont's uh, green, uh, pure air reputation and just <laughs> went right around us. At least that's what that, I'm telling myself. Yeah, that, that's fortunate. Um, you know, it's something that we deal with seasonally. Uh, I'm in the West Coast. I'm on the Western side of the country, Arizona and you know, you get the wild wild uh, fires in Colorado, California. So we we see it on a pretty regular basis, and of course, we get it here locally as well. Um, but I'm glad that it seems to be missing you. That's yeah, that's nice. Yeah, no, we're we've been very fortunate. That's why I'm I'm happy living here. But um, let uh, let's go on to today's first segment, which is our defend the take. Brad, you're up today. Uh, Madison, will you bring up the time reform? Brad has 90 seconds to defend a take. Um, today, Brad's take is, let us give a second for the timer to come up. So we've talked a lot about artificial intelligence lately. Actually, the last couple of weeks, it's been red hot. Um, and we've talked about, you know, how hot it can stay. Um, you know, we were a little skeptical about that last week, but um it seems like things may be cooled off a little bit. Um, it's okay. I can sell, I can go ahead and self time you, Brad, but your take is uh, 20%. So 20% of the S and P companies mentioned AI in their most recent quarterly earnings call. You think the next quarter, it'll be less than half that you have 90 seconds. Go. Right, Madison, if you want to start that timer yeah no it's okay i can i got it i got it it is not loading today but <laughs> it's friday awesome awesome that. first attempt all yeah. right we will self time all right 20 percent of the s p 500 mentioned ai in the most recent earnings quarter uh next quarter it's going to be less than half that and my, my rationale for for that is something that we've talked about before which is like the accelerated hype cycle right we saw it with blockchain tech Nine months later, we saw it with Metaverse. Nine months after that, we're now seeing it with AI. But anybody that's going to try and jam AI into their product offerings the, has already captured that low-hanging fruit. Next quarter is when that those efforts need to start showing some sort of dividend, right? So we were critical of some of the AI hype uh, when we were talking with Rich, I believe. Uh, Rich Howe, yep. Rich Howe. Um, because you can roll out a an API, an AI call. Basically, you, your website calls to an AI service on an external website. And you can create a chat bot or you can create a customer service thing. But that doesn't translate to your bottom line immediately. 
So as much opportunity as there may be in AI as a as a segment of the growing economy, as a growth sector, it, the easy returns are already baked in. And I think what you'll see is because of the accelerated hype cycle, companies that announced the that did the early announcement that they were integrating AI, when that doesn't pay dividends, they're just going to go radio silent. And I think that there's that Time. less than mm, <laughs> le less than half of the companies that are promising to integrate AI are going to do so profitably. So you're going to see that fall off the earnings announcements. Yeah, I mean, I, think I may have mentioned this last week, last year, uh, and going back even the year before, the hot button words that you saw that turned up in a lot of earnings calls is inflation. Uh, prior to that, it was um, supply chain. <laughs> a lot of those, both of those were used as excuses, really, for yeah. bad earnings. AI, it's trying to, you know, juice excitement. So I guess this is this is a reflection of something we're going to get to in a second, a more positive um, sort of atmosphere. Uh, so you'd think they'd want to mention AI as long as it sort of stays hot. But I guess your point is it won't be the red hot must have three months from now that it, you know, that it has been the last month or so. Yeah, if if Lululemon comes out and says, "Oh, we're integrating AI into our customer experience," and a quarter from now it doesn't lead to any increased profitability, new product lines, or anything that's like viable for them, they're not going to they're not going to say, "Oh, yeah, we said we were doing AI, but that didn't that didn't help at all." They're just going to not right. mention it. And right. I think that, I think a lot of companies uh, do the pivot to AI thing, and maybe maybe half less than half are are going to actually find a way to integrate it profitably because i think a lot of it is novelty right now yeah um let's move on to our our big three uh number one as you mentioned uh we are now in officially in a new bull market uh s&p had to hit uh, yeah. <laughs> i take credit for as the as the counter indicator for the yeah. one it's i i am solely responsible for the bull market you are so yeah um yeah, it needed to hit 42.92 in the S and P 500 to be up 20 percent uh, from the bottom October bottom, and it has done that. It ran out 43.11 as I yeah. as I say this. Um, you know, the breadth of this bull market has been quite narrow. Uh, we've talked a lot about it. Like it's like seven or eight mega cap stocks: uh, Microsoft, Amazon. Uh, Meta, Nvidia have led the charge, and then yeah. you know now lately. AI has has been a driving force as well, which has trickled down to some lower, uh, you know, lower cap tech tech stocks. Um, so let me give you some numbers on now. Granted, even though there's a unique bull market, let me give you some numbers. Uh, this courtesy of Ryan Dietrich, who we often rely on, uh, works for for CME Group uh, Carson uh, Research Group. Excuse me. Um, the lot there's been the last thirteen times that. There has been a bear market, and then uh, we've reached bull market status. So stocks have soared 20% off the 52-week low. Um, Ten of those times, uh, stocks continued to keep running. They, they did not retreat back to their lows. Um, 12 out of 13 times, stocks were up a year later, and for an average gain of 17.7%. Uh, the one time, the one misfire was in 2001, uh, right after the, the <laughs> dot-com bubble burst. And that was a few years of really a bear market. Um, so those stats bode well, you know, bode well for this continuing. But again, we said this, is, this has been led by a very narrow range of tech stocks. What do you see happening this time? So I didn't know those numbers until you just brought them up. Um, yeah. Of all the instances in which a 20% rally off a 52-week low, uh, you know, didn't result in sustained runs, the worst one you could have mentioned is dot-com. Because it's, the, the dot-com bubble was a similarly hype-fueled, narrow-breadth rally that was predominantly led by growth stocks. So that that makes me a little bit hesitant to like fully buy into it. 
Um, mm-hmm. I think here here's my here's my pitch as sort of a best case scenario for this market rally. Tech cools down, and we see a rotation into weak sectors. That's that. I mean, like that's that's the best case scenario because there's two things that can sort of fix an overvalued stock, and that's either the price coming down or time, right? Like if you've got an upward trending, say, 50 day moving average over a period of months, if you get a super hot stock that then moves sideways over a period of months, that catches up and it it allows buyers to sort of participate over time. The other option is price go down and then you have people coming in at a more attractive entry price. So I, I've been, this market has been climbing the wall of worry. We talked about that. I'm, I'm certainly part of that, that worry, right? Like, I don't, I don't see this as being a super strong throw, you know, throw call options on everything kind of rally. It, it, it's definitely, um, it's definitely weird with it being driven by so few tech stocks, but there is a scenario in which this transforms from a narrow rally into a broader rally. That's just going to take some rotation. That's going to take some of the, the unloved sectors heating up a little bit. Yeah. But the average 12 month gain during those 13, uh, new bull markets, uh, like I said, 17.7%, I would take the under for sure on that. I, you know, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think, I don't think stocks are going to be down 22% a year from now, like, uh, or no. even down period, uh, like during the, the turn of the century bubble. Um, but yeah, I would say modest gains year out from now. Um, you know, I, I don't think I don't think we're going to explode higher from here. Um, but let's move on to number two. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll let you take the reins on that one. So number two, crypto crackdown, the SEC unveiled enforcement actions against both Binance and Coinbase. Um, the both of them are facing allegations of acting as unregistered securities dealers. Uh, predominantly, it's for the cryptocurrencies that are offering a staking yield. Um, e- Ethereum, they seem to not be targeting, despite the fact that it does have a staking yield. Um, and I think that's probably because it and Bitcoin have uh, have been around long enough and are established enough that they are, they're being treated more as commodities. Bitcoin de- definitely is being treated as a, com- as a commodity. Um, but with Binance, there's, there's allegations that um, that they were similar to FTX, you know, a couple of years ago, that they were artificially inflating trading volumes on their platforms, that they were misappropriating customer funds. Um, really, the the biggest takeaway for me is probably don't participate don't participate in the the smaller coin offerings if you're if you're still invested in crypto, probably focus on Bitcoin, maybe ETH. Um, but also learn self custody because if we we're seeing it time and time again, you can't trust these big exchanges. Um, ultimately, I think it's probably a good thing for the space if it ever wants to mature and grow up, because some of this enforcement action will get bad actors out of it. It's still it it gained a reputation as being a really scammy, um, money money laundry, um. Ponzi scheme kind of place. And it that was a, a deserved reputation. Some enforcement action here, shutting down some of the bad bad actors, even if they happen to run, you know, the third biggest crypto exchange, um, will help the maturity of the space. I don't know that it's going to be great for returns in the immediate future. Uh, I know you had called Bitcoin over 30 or 40,000. Over before. 40 before. Oh, that was my dead friend to take a few weeks ago. I said that. Bitcoin would get back to over 40,000 now at 26. I think it was 27 at the time um, before oil gets back to hundred dollars a barrel. Um, I, I still believe that, you know, especially partly because I, I think that crypto is sort of a, a bull market play, Bitcoin bull market play, yeah. even though I don't trust crypto fundamentally really yet. Um, you know, it's, we just mentioned that this is sort of a, an asterisk bull mark market. So yeah. 
maybe it won't push up Bitcoin the way it has in previous bull markets. Um, but you know, for now, it, like you said, it's not it's not hitting Bitcoin. It's not hurting Bitcoin. Yeah, when when the enforcement action was announced, Coinbase dropped twenty percent intraday. Uh, ended up closing the day down seventeen point eight percent or so, eight somewhere around eighteen percent. Uh, Bitcoin was down four percent. Right? It's yeah. People are looking at it and saying, okay, well, we don't really want to be we don't want to be invested in the exchanges directly. The BNB token, um, similar to FTX's native token, took a big hit, but Bitcoin didn't. And it, it seems like the uh, the SEC and regulators are sort of uh, painting a, a scenario in which Bitcoin is actually a commodity because it doesn't pay a yield. It's it's based on proof of work. So there's no staking mechanism. So if you had to have picked a, a crypto token two weeks ago, uh, it's fortunate that it was Bitcoin. That that one seems likely to weather the storm better than any of the others. Yeah. And once we get further removed from the Coinbase news, you, you'd think, especially you know, that now that the market's in bull market territory, that maybe Bitcoin will sort of ride its coattails. We'll see. Um, let's move to number three. And that is simply uh, the last, as you sent, said, the last nail in the coffin for the meme stocks, the infamous meme stocks. And that was GameStops uh, came out with just horrendous earnings the other day. Um, they, well, first off, they got rid of their CEO, uh, Matthew Furlong, uh, Ryan Cohen named as executive chairman. It doesn't matter. It is, it's who, who is the new captain of the Titanic as it's going down? Um <laughs> And reported a net loss of fifty million dollars. You you have some stats on how the meme stocks have done, uh, have performed since their highs. Of, what was that? Uh, Jan February, January, February of twenty twenty one. Uh, it was like June 2021 when it really when, when they, they okay. when they all peaked. And yeah. the the reason that I wanted to bring this one up and that I think it's significant is um, the just I blanked on his name, the CEO of GME of GameStop was the CEO. Furlong, uh, Furlong was a CEO of Chewy.com uh, before he was brought on. He was a very vocal champion of the um, democratized investing, socialized investing, however you want to phrase it, the you know power of the people uh, to support shares in the face of like massive short sales and stuff like that. He was a very vocal champion um, when he was let go, that seems like the final nail on the coffin of all the meme stocks. GameStop is down 73% since its highs two years ago. It was down 18% on the, the day that the CEO was let go. Another favorite of the Wall Street bets and very online investing crowd was uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, down 99.4% from its highs. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's actively in bankruptcy and it's trading over the counter now, yeah. so it's not even a not even listed on exchange. AMC and these three, there's nothing special about these three. They just happen to sort of catch the peak wave of interest, and enough people all sort of agreed that they would be the ones to take off. Right, Palantir was a very popular one, but never took off the same way. But AMC down ninety two percent from its meme stock highs um, they had issued shares called ape uh, ape they it, it's just a way to get the uh to get the ticker symbol because you know diamond hand ape right like all the online investing terminology is you ape into something they just wanted the ticker down 72 percent they just settled a shareholder lawsuit about uh, their plans to convert the preferred equity units, the APE, to AMC common shares, and then conduct a reverse, a ten for one, a one for ten reverse split. And on uh, May fourth, as part of the settlement, AMC essentially came out and said, um, "If we're unable to pursue this this course of action, we are likely to pursue bankruptcy." So, it, yeah. it was never a sustainable model. No. You you go online and get all your friends to all buy the same stock doesn't make a company a good company. Yeah, right. I, I think um, this is we said we sort of said it at the time. This is a pretty uh, top of a bull market tell. Uh, you yeah. know, I mean, it didn't quite top until a few months later, but it was close. 
Uh, this is when things were really frothy. You know, just you know, GameStop, these are three companies that were dying. Circling the drain, death, yeah. Dying a slow death, having their best moments as stocks. Into it, you know that's not sustainable. You know that's purely a bull market, frothy bull market um, sort of product. I mean, GameStop, 2016, $9.36 billion in revenue. Uh, 2022 was down to a little more than half that, $5.9 billion. AMC, you know, this happened at a time when people could even go to movie theaters, basically. Um, yeah. And then it... Bed Bath & Beyond has been, you know, it it along with many big box retailers, I guess it's not big box, many retail chains and sort of that space has, has been sort of, uh, has, his best days, best days were clearly behind it. Yeah, with so with GameStop, if I, right, I have an Xbox, uh, my kids play it, I play it occasionally. I can just download games on my Xbox. I don't have to go buy one, right? Like that's, so GameStop is a, a victim of technological improvement. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, their product quality was never particularly high. Uh, it's very, it, it, you know, it's not different from what you would get from a seller on Amazon selling some random knockoff product. AMC, as you said, middle of a pandemic, uh, that one of, of those three, I would have the highest hopes that AMC could potentially bounce back because yeah. people are starting to go back to theaters. They're, they're more actively participating uh, or they're, uh, they're re they're returning to the movies. People are interested in the experience thing, right? So there, revenue there's was way up, way up last year, and it's off to a good start this year. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. AMC was just sort of a it it happened to have been really heavily shorted, yeah. um, but that that one of the of the three big meme stocks maybe has the best the best case for a recovery. Um, but it, it's it's healthy, I guess, for the market to see the the death of this. Yeah this sort of legacy of just pure greed i mean it, yeah. it's it's remarkable how frothy things got back then yeah and the lesson is if if you see this happen again if there's if the word meme stocks ever resurfaces if there become new meme stocks might be time to start uh thinking about slowing down your buying <laughs> possibly even selling some of your weakest stocks. And then you'll know that, you know, say this bull market really takes off in five years down the road. If there's a new set of meme stocks, that means, you know, I mean, you know, uh, the rallies on borrowed time. Yeah. Tighten up your portfolio a little bit, uh, but we need to move on. We need to bring on Tom Hutchinson. He is chief analyst of Cabot Income Advisor and Cabot Dividend Investor and the Retirement Club. We welcome in Tom Hutchinson, who is chief analyst of our Cabot Dividend Investor and Cabot Income Advisor Advisories, uh, industry veteran, uh, dividend expert, income expert. Uh, Tom, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Great to be here with you guys and, and our uh, great subscribers. Are you ensconced in uh, in smog or wildfire smog right now down there? It's in getting better. It was horrible, like at noon uh, two days ago on what, Wednesday, I had to turn on the lights because it was so dark and the forecast was for sunny. There was no cloud cover. That's how bad it was. That's crazy. Wow. Uh, I was telling Brad earlier, I'm in Vermont, which you'd think, you know, I'm further north of you. I think I'd be right in the line of fire, but it somehow mostly missed us. We never had the, you know, end of days, red sky that, that you guys are having. So. Yeah, it was really bad here. It's a lot better now. Good. Good. Well, yeah. that'll, that means you'll have a clear head. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, it's it's kind of wild that you guys are experiencing this. I always, you know, treat it as a West Coast phenomenon because, yeah. you, you know, we we deal with it pretty regularly. You know, when I was in Prescott, we got evacuated out of a couple of wildfire uh, issues, or, you know, uh, emergencies, and, and we dealt with the smoke stuff on a pretty regular basis. So it's it's wild to see it happening in the East Coast. Yeah, it's weird. Um, so let's move on to uh, clearer skies, which is the market uh, right now, uh, at least relative to what it has been. It, it is. We are technically now in a bull market. You know, Tom, I know you, you've written a lot about um, you're sort of say, taking a cautiously optimistic stance. Your stance has kind of been you may see some pullback, uh, but then things could really get going second half of the year. Um, you know, obviously, the the breadth of this rally has been very narrow, maybe limited to about seven or eight stocks, very large stocks, plus AI. I mean, AI joining has really helped, it seems. What's, what are your, 
in the dividend realm, what are you, are you kind of wary of technology right now since that's really led this rally or what are you looking at right now? Well, I think that like you said, uh, we're in a bull market now. It's been pretty good this year, right? But the participation is awful. I mean, it's like yeah. 10 stocks are responsible for all the gains. Right. And the other 490 stocks on the S&P 500 have collectively done nothing. Yeah. Uh, so it's a weird rally. Now, could technology keep going? Yeah, it could. But you have to figure the rally either has to broaden out or it's going to peter out. Yeah. And yeah, that's... Sorry, I, I was just going to say that's something, you know, both uh, Bruce Kayser and and Tyler London have written about recently is the narrowness of this rally. And I think, I think everybody's sort of pinning their hopes on the broaden out thing. But yeah. I... I, I think you you are maybe not buying into the broaden out quite as much as as maybe some of the more optimistic uh, writers and, and analysts out there. Well, I'm buying in a little more than I did a couple of weeks ago because <laughs> right. the, the recession keeps not happening. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still I, getting back to your earlier question, Chris. I kind of like the defensive areas, healthcare, or utilities. Yeah. Things that have lagged so far this year because. If the market, if the rally does broaden out, given the contracting earnings market we're in, and we'll, we should have at least a slowing economy, that should really in, incorporate the defensive issues into the broadening rally. Now, if the rally does peter out, uh, you're still better off in the defensive issues. So that's kind of where I am now. Yeah. Um, and I know energy is been an area where you've had some success is that somewhere where you, you mentioned healthcare ut utilities energy something you're still fairly bullish on or is it more of a holding pattern would you say right now it's a it's a little of both um, yeah. i added an energy stock has uh to the portfolio yep. uh, last month yep. and i believe intermediate term is very bullish for energy i think that the supply situation is not going to keep up with the demand and it's not going to get better. Uh, now, if the economy slows a lot or we do get that recession that never comes, uh, yeah, they, they could go down in the short term. Uh, but still, I think a year from now, I, I think these energy stocks are going to be a lot higher. Brad, you had a question about... Uh... So the bond funds that uh, that Tom has in his portfolios, yeah. But before we get there, there's one thing that I think I've I've chimed up about uh, a couple of times that Tom writes that that I really like, which is the nobody knows where the next ten percent move is going to be, but the next hundred percent move is up. And I just wanted to take the opportunity while he's on with us to highlight that that's a really good perspective to have, uh, because you know Tom's talking about well. You know, if the rally keeps going, the laggards are going to catch up, and if it doesn't, they're gonna they're gonna hold up better. So it's th that positioning of um, cautious optimism I, I really like. But one thing that I had mentioned to Chris that I was curious about, and partially this is because um, Income Advisor recently changed its format to include a fixed income allocation. Um, do you like? bonds, bond funds, fixed income at these rates? Or are you maybe holding back a little bit, hoping that we could see an improvement in the rate situation even further? Well, again, uh, I'm hedging a little bit like I am with the stock market. Uh, but when you see, like we did, um, rates on investment grade fixed income go up to 15 year highs. And, and offer a fixed rate alternative to diversify that has not been available in years and years and years, I think, and, and believe me, everyone who has, just about everyone who has a stock portfolio has a lot of investable money someplace else. And you, you for the first time in a long time, have the chance to get a decent return on it. Could rates go higher in a scenario where in, in inflation sticks around and either we don't get a recovery? 
I mean, we don't get a recession or into the next, could they go a little higher? Yeah. But I don't think investors can miss this opportunity to at least to some degree, get some of this high rate fixed income stuff that's now available. So even if even if it's not a, a full allocation of say you know thirty or forty percent of the portfolio, something a strategy like dollar cost averaging into some fixed income investments is probably beneficial for most investors at these rates. I think so. Now, yeah, can I think of a scenario where they spike higher? Sure, but they're unlikely to average there over the next five years because, frankly, with thirty three trillion in debt, the country can't afford it. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, if rates go up and the price go down for a little bit, I'll buy more. Uh, but yeah. it, it's still, uh, I think, an opportune time for investors to grab some of this. You know, it, it reminds me, uh, my grandfather in the 70s bought like a I don't know, whole life policy that was yielding like 32 percent or something <laughs> insane like that. Right. And I, re I remember in the course of like the last decade, last 15 years, thinking to myself, if I ever saw a treasury paying 9%, I just put all my money in there and walk away and, and just take it. And it doesn't seem like we're going to get there, but five and a half percent, six percent on some investment, investment grade stuff certainly looks uh, like an attractive opportunity now. It's possible. And if that happens, I will grab it and up the allocation and in fixed income. But say we don't get there. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I will have failed to my subscribers if I didn't alert them to the fact that they should lock in these 15 year high fixed income rates. Uh, and they don't last and you don't get another opportunity, it would be a, a, a very, uh, would be unfortunate. So yeah, uh, I'm 20% in the Cabot dividend investor portfolio and fixed income. Not that big, but um, you know, I can always be nimble and depending on what happens. Yeah, and, and speaking of being nimble, going back to stocks, um, you know, we mentioned the how narrow this rally has been. Um, you know, ordinarily you think bull, new bull market has started, you know, maybe dividend stocks are almost, certain dividend stocks could almost be considered too conservative for a new bull market, but that's not the case this time with, you know, a lot of the sectors you mentioned really lagging and seemingly poised for a big bounce back. I mean, are you sort of treating this as if we're not necessarily in a bear market still, but, you know, that this isn't some go-go bull market because it really isn't aside from the 10 stocks you mentioned. Yeah, and there's something else going on, I think. Uh, there's sort of a, a new situation unfolding. Unlike the past couple of recoveries in the past decades that we've seen. Yeah, you know, maybe we get a recession, maybe we don't, maybe we never get another big sell-off. But what's the recovery going to look like? Because in the past recoveries, the Fed knocked the Fed funds rate down to zero and left it there. Uh, QE by the trillions all over the place. I don't think they're going to do that this time. Because any time before in, in recent history, or well, last hundred years, inflation has been this high for this long. It's never not taken at least a decade to get rid of. And there's a scenario like we saw in the 70s where we'd get a situation like this, the Fed hikes rates, inflation gets under control, and then into the next recovery, inflation comes back stronger than it was the last time. And that happened several times throughout the 70s. I think the Fed is aware of that and really don't want to be responsible and have to fight a decade of inflation largely caused by their own uh, mis mistakes. Um, so I don't think they're going to take the foot off its neck uh, in the next recovery and lower rates to the extent they have. They may lower them a little bit, but nowhere near the 0%. And that was a big part that fueled these insane bull markets. So we may get a lame bear market followed by a lame bull market. And really, the more sideways type action favors dividend stocks a lot because they're a bigger part of the market's return. 
So are you taking the Fed at face value when they come out and say, hey, we're going to pay attention to the data, we're going to take things as they come? Um, that has largely been my pitch for the last year or so. Um, but I'm curious what, what your stance is there. Yeah, I, I think they're going to remain aggressive. I mean, look at the ma dual mandate of uh, unemployment and price stability. Well, the employment scene is fun. Yeah. You know, there should be nothing holding them back, really. Um, they, you got to kill this inflation. You can't let it hang around. They know that. They're embarrassed because they missed the call. <laughs> they want to kill this off soon so they're not, uh, you know, lessons in uh, business schools for the next uh, five decades over what not to do, you know. Right. <laughs> I, I think they're going to yeah. continue to be aggressive. Yeah. What was the word? I can't even remember the word. They, it wasn't fleeting inflation. It was, uh, what was Transitory. It? Transitory. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That was, <laughs> that was a wrong call. Yeah. That was, um, yeah. That come back to haunt them. Do you think there's a number, Brad and I have talked about this. Do you think there's a number, you know, they keep saying 2%, but it, it seems very, as you said, it seems very unlikely uh, inflation is going to come down to 2% anytime soon. Uh, do you think there's a number of, that they would see where they think, okay, maybe now we can take our foot off the gas or possibly even cut rates. Do you think it is, they're going to hold to the 2% or do you think it, they sort of move the goalposts and change it to 3% or something like that? I think they'll move the goalpost if they have to. Yeah. And they're certainly not going to, I don't think, unless there's some deep recession, cut rates this year. Yeah. Because they're going to be under an enormous amount of pressure next year. Because the economy will still be kind of limping along. It's an election year. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure to start lowering rates. So they, they, they're probably going to set themselves up for that, too. Yeah. And, you know, maybe they lower them to 3% uh, if the economy slows or there's a reset, but they're not they're not going back to zero. Yeah. And, and the 2%, if, if it's a problem, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll ratchet it up to 3%. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, we, looking back at past times when they raised rates to basically above 5%, um, you know, uh, they've always when they've topped out they've kept that they kept that rate in place for at least eight months so even if there's only one more rate hike say in july you know i, I thought a few weeks ago I said on this podcast i thought they would hold rates exactly where they are for the rest of the year that could be wrong um but i, I agree unless yeah. of course there's some economic problem that we don't see yeah whether, um, whether it's a serious recession or maybe the banking crisis erupts. In the absence of an event like that, there's, I, I don't think there's any way they lower rates this year. Agreed. Yeah. So I, I wanted I wanted to try and summarize a little bit um, this conversation. Um, it sounds like in the event that we have either a struggling market going forward, or as you put it, a weak bull market, rates are going to stay high. Inflation is going to remain somewhat persistent, maybe not as bad. And it, it sounds like the the big pitch for, for dividend stocks and for fixed income is at these rates is, hey, even if the market doesn't go anywhere, if you're making four and a half, five percent on your money, whether it's a dividend or whether it's yield, that's going to allow you to weather inflation and continue participating in the market until we hit like a, a new strong bull market. I mean, like it doesn't feel like a bull market. I mean, you and I, the no, three but... of us have been navigating this for 18 months along with everybody else. It certainly doesn't feel like we're 20% off the lows, but but let's say that maybe the bull market is, is tame. Dividend stocks, income investing, that's going to allow you to stay fully involved in the market, fully invested and outperform persistently high or elevated inflation is that a is that a, a fair sort of elevator pitch yeah i think that's a fair assessment and, and i think also in an environment where the bull market isn't raging economic growth isn't raging that is typically uh an environment where the relative performance of def more defensive stocks tends to thrive and to back that up tom uh 
your Kappa Dividend Investor Advisory has been one of the best performing over the last 18 months, um, you know, at a time when a lot of our growth advisories have struggled along with just about every growth advisory out there. Um, I think the average gain on your stocks in there, a lot of which you you hold on for a while, um, is 43 to 44%, which is pretty good in this kind of environment. Um, so you're looking for you're looking for, you know, kind of just to slowly build, you know, pick out the sectors that are maybe undervalued, energy, utilities, healthcare, whatever, and just continue adding that way, I assume, you know, rather than, you know, you're not going to try and jump on the the technology bandwagon or anything uh, too much, I would think. Yeah, for the most part, yeah. uh, the gist of it is defense, but the portfolio has three technology stocks it it sure. I, i've had broadcom in there for for a couple of years now and that participated yep um it, it kind of you know you can talk about the overall market all day but it also matters what the individual stocks are right i mean healthcare has done not much this year it's down uh but eli Lilly's way up um, yeah right. so it matters and yeah and I also added an energy stock that it really isn't that consistent with the defensive strategy to sort of you know hedge the bets of the overall portfolio. Yeah. Well, if you want to subscribe to uh, either of Tom's advisors, again, that that one I mentioned, uh, Cabot Dividend Investor uh, has really good gains uh, for this market, and then Cabot Income Advisors. Similar, but it also has a covered call aspect. Uh, a lot of your covered call trades, I guess maybe just quickly describe sort of the philosophy there on your covered call trades and, and income advisor. Yeah, well, income advisor um, is is really designed to get a high income from, from your investments because a lot of people need it. Yeah. At least part of their portfolio that, that churns out a decent income. And the covered call strategy along with the dividends, uh, enables you to do that. So th there are many positions, even in the market that's sort of been struggling, even though it's been good lately, it's still down you know, 10% from where it was at the end of uh, 2021. Even in a market like that, uh, a lot of, uh, I think most of the positions it, it's had have had double digit income gains, double digit total return even in a crummy market uh, by just juicing the income and, and timing it well uh, when to uh, sell a covered call. Yes. Yeah, so been... so, sorry. I was going to say, so again, those are Cabot dividend investor, Cabot income advisor, both on the cabotwealth.com website under premium advisories uh, for those interested, Brad, you had one last thing you wanted to. Yeah, the so something we had talked about with Andy last week is uh, sort of the volatility bull market. And that's something that benefits Income Advisor because it juices the value of those covered calls that are being sold. So when you're trying to prioritize income, even in a bad market, there are opportunities to to increase those yields and increase those returns. And that's something that CIA has seen, that Income Advisor has seen all year. Yeah, I've had stocks in the portfolio that have done nothing and maybe even down a little bit, the total return of the stock since being added to the portfolio. But from generating covered calls, uh, there's an income return, of, you know, in some cases, 30, 40 percent. So the stock doesn't have to do anything. You can still use it as a vehicle to generate income. Right. Well, Tom, thanks for thanks for joining us. I know you're eager to get back out there and gulp some of that fresh New Jersey uh, wildfire. Yeah, yeah, can't wait. <laughs> All right, but, well, um, thanks for having me. It was great. Yeah, really appreciate it. And we will be back next Friday with another edition of Street Check. Yeah, and don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review, uh, smash that subscribe button, peeps. All right, have a great weekend.